Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Selecting a Safe and Clean Cannabis Product, a Parent's Quest to Find the Best Medicine for His Son, presented by Sebastian Cott. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the ask a question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Sebastian Cott. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Oh, thank you so much, Judy, uh, for this introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this presentation. I'm uh, very excited to share with you a little bit of some of the tips uh, that I found were very helpful for me when I was looking for medical cannabis to get started with medical cannabis with my son. So we're going to go through a few different um, items today that you are to look at and take into consideration when you want to start medical cannabis therapy. First of all, what I want to start with is the boring stuff, the disclaimer. I know, I know, but we got to do it. Pretty much, if you don't want to read it, all it says is that I am not a doctor and everything I'm going to tell you has not been approved, evaluated by the FDA. So please do not take this as medical advice and get anybody in trouble. All right. Thank you so much. So a little bit about me. Like I just say, I'm not a medical professional. I'm really just a dad. And I am Jagger's dad. In the middle of the screen is a picture of the side. I'm sorry. You can see Jagger. That's my little boy. And we'll talk more about Jagger in just a few minutes. But here's the reason why I'm doing this. Uh, while I've been trying to help Jagger, I've been learning a lot about cannabis. And I've been certified by American for Safe Access. I'm also founded with a few other parents a group called Georgia's Hope. This is a group of parents that was responsible and still is responsible to, uh, for the medical cannabis legislation here in the state of Georgia. Um, I'm the board of director of the Flowering Hope Foundation and board of advisor of MD Herb. All of those are volunteer only uh, position. Um, I do not have any financial uh, interest or any financial gain from cannabis. I'm just really focused on education and trying to help people and mostly parents learn more about this amazing plant. So now let's talk about Jagger. That is my little boy. Jagger has a very rare form of mitochondrial disease called Lee's disease. Lee's disease is very progressive and unfortunately it's terminal. Uh, if you get your diagnostic before the age of two, 95% of the kids with Lee's disease will not make it past their fourth birthday. And Jagger, unfortunately, got his diagnostic at age one, and he's been on hospice since then. When we were not able to pass a medical cannabis bill in the state of Georgia in 2014, my wife Annette, Jagger, and I moved to Colorado and became medical refugees so we could get Jagger on medical cannabis. Now, it's much harder than it sounds, and then, you know, you can just put on a slide. Um, in order to do that, I actually took a week of vacation. I went to Colorado, and I did some research, and I looked at a few things. And some of the stuff I looked at and some of the things that I learned from that trip, we will discuss in this presentation because those are very important tips and advice that any parent uh, or patient can, be, can, can use. We were in Colorado for 13 months. And we came back home after uh, 13 months, mostly because Jagger breathing uh, with the altitude in Colorado was getting worse, but everything else was going much better. On the picture on the screen, this is actually August 20th, 2014, Jagger very first dose of CBD. Uh, we started with CBD and we added other cannabinoids down the road. And today Jagger is on CBD, THC, and CBN for sleep. But that is a picture a couple minutes before we gave him his very first dose after a really long, difficult trek to Colorado from Georgia that took us six days in a car 
um, because Jaguar is not allowed to fly due to his breathing issue. Anyhow, uh, the cannabis has been great for Jagger, and uh, Jagger just uh, in last September turned seven, so he's now three and a half years past his life expectancy. Uh, he still has a terminal disease, I think that's important to note. He's still on hospice, but uh, for him and for our family, it's all about quality of life, and no more about quality of li- uh, the quantity of life. You know, it's all about the quantity and not, I'm sorry, do that again. It's all about the quality of life and not the quantity of life. When you are an hospice patient, you know your time is limited. So you want to make the best of the time you have. And you want to make sure that the patient, the kid or the adult is living uh, the best quality possible with the less pain. And this is really what cannabis has done for us. It reduced Jagger seizures from anywhere between 12 to 15 a day to 3 to 4 a day. And it reduces pain tremendously. Jagger has a lot of muscle pain. Uh, Kids with mitochondrial disease can build lactic acid in their muscle, and it's very painful. It it, it leads to very bad cramping. Jagger is nonverbal. He's a seven-year-old, a body of seven-year-old, but he's like more of the mind of a three-month-old, so he doesn't speak to us. He doesn't tell us what's wrong, so it's always a big guessing game with him. Uh, Now, obviously, over time, we get to know what's wrong with him, and we get to know his triggers, but... Uh, it's really hard, uh, especially when he has those muscle pain crisis, because we don't exactly always know where uh, this is happening. So hospice will give him oxycotton and Valium and methadone and morphine. Uh, we decided to try THC for those, and with the help of THC, we reduced those muscle pain episodes by close to 90%. And we have him now for over three and a half years, 100% off oxycotton and about 95% off morphine. So when we talk about this big opioids crisis in this country, it's very important to keep in mind that cannabis should be an option because it can help a lot of the patient and kids like Jagger. But we did not get to here um, overnight. It took us a while. We had to learn a lot. We had to do a lot of research. We have to play with dosing. We had to talk to doctors. But mostly we had to find a safe product. And that was uh, very difficult. The reason why is because we experiencing a green rush now with uh, CBD and cannabis to another extent. Everybody's making a product. Everybody's trying to sell you a product. And not every product is safe and clean. So this is what this presentation, hopefully, is going to do. Uh, you guys got to take off some guidelines from this presentation on how to find a safe product. This presentation is not going to go into a brand specific. This is not what we're here for. It's just going to be very generic on what are you looking for, what kind of questions you should ask when somebody is trying to sell you a product. And it's going to be divided in three main parts. The first is to know the origin of your product. Then is to know the product. And finally, very important, know the law, because not everything is legal everywhere in this country. And I know this audience today is very coming from all different states and part of the country. Um, and not everybody has the same legal protection or legal rights. So this is very important to keep in mind. We're going to start with knowing the origin of the product. So knowing the origin of the product is, first of all, is who is growing your cannabis plant? Is it grown in the U.S.? Is it grown overseas? Is it imported? Um, how is it grown? And where is it grown? Is it grown in a legal state so you can have some protection and hopefully you have uh, a, a program set up and it's actually a real company growing it with protocols? and um, guideline and regulation, or is it somebody growing it in their closet, in the back of their yard, in their basement, in an illegal state? That does make a big difference. Uh, if it's grown in the U.S., uh, is it grow, where is it grown uh, in the U.S.? Is it, uh, you get different strain from different parts. California and cannabis is very different from Colorado cannabis, for example. Can you visit the growth? That is very important for parents sometimes when they're not really sure where the product comes from. Uh, you could ask the grower, if you could come and visit. Now, I'm, they're going to tell you not every grower are going to say yes, come and you, you, you're allowed to do that. But it could be taken as a little bit of a red flag if they're very much against it. Uh, again, you know, you gotta, some rules and regulation could be different. But for me, at least, when I was able to, to visit the growth of the product we use for Jagger when I was in Colorado, that was a huge peace of mind because I realized this is not your college dealer, you know, growing in his basement. This is a very well-organized company with employees and guidelines and safety measures and, uh, you know, 
almost to the point or it will be like a, a business, a, a really manufacturing business with OSHA requirement. It, it's, um, it was very impressive to me when they, it was actually a real business. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. If you can visit it, it's always better. No, you will not always gonna be able to do that, but if you can, it's always better. And then the credential of the grower. Uh, how long has it been grow? He or she has been growing. Have they developed strain? Are they just really putting seed on the ground and then you know nourishing them and watering them, or are they actually doing development too? Are they doing some breeding? Uh, all that stuff is very important. And usually you can find that information by googling it or asking other parents, other patients, um, you know, in the community. Have you using X Y Z product? Do you know anything about X Y Z uh, grow or this is you know which strain is this? Who grow that strain? There are resources in, in support groups to be able to find my information or on the internet. So that's about the grower and the growing of the cannabis. Uh, one other thing too is, is it grow indoor or outdoor? Uh, it's very controversial. A lot of people would tell you one is better than the other. Uh, I don't look at it like that. I look at it as if it's grow outdoor, you have to be a little bit more careful on some of the lab report you're gonna need. And we will talk about lab report in the second part of this presentation. Uh, it's a little bit easier to control the environment, obviously, if you grow in a greenhouse indoor. Uh, you can still get some of the sun benefits um, in the greenhouse, but you can control uh, maybe the pests uh, and the weather a little bit better. So that's something to keep in mind. But again, there's not one better than the other. Uh, they both can make very good, both indoor and outdoor can make very good quality cannabis. The other thing I look for, uh, and that's just because I have a business background, so I always look for that, it's called, something called vertical integration. If you do not know what vertical integration means, it pretty much means that the company is in charge of every aspect of the product development, manufacturing, all the way to the sales. So in the world of cannabis, you will be then the same person or company is growing, putting the seed or the clone on the ground, growing it, taking care of it during the growing period, you know, with uh, feeding it and watering it and making sure it's okay, harvesting it, drying it, curing it if needed, extracting it and then uh, putting it into bottle to go out to a dispensary or sell it directly. So the reason I like this is because you get a much better control. It's one company overseeing every single aspect of the process. Um, I'm not saying when you know, some of the products which are not vertical, vertically integrated are bad. I'm just saying you have more chance of something going wrong. If you have a grower that is selling that product to an extractor that is selling that product to a bottler to put in the bottles, to is selling that product to a distributor, that is selling that product to a dispensary. You got four or five people touching that product and you know putting their hands on it, and things can get much more messed up when, when you know that way. However, something to keep in mind is that vertical integration is not legal in every state. In some states, the person extracting it. Uh, cannot grow it, it's a different type of licenses, or the dispensary setting it can also not grow it. Um, so you got to keep that in mind that while vertical integration give you a better peace of mind than your product is probably, um, you know, has less chance of something go wrong of it, it's not legal everywhere. Now let's talk about the product a little bit. That is where it can get very, very confusing and very tricky for parents and patients because there are so many different products in the market. So we're gonna break it down in a few things. The first thing we're gonna break it down to is the extraction method. Now, we could honestly do a two hours presentation just on this extraction method um, and the different method and their pros and cons and people won't agree and there will be a lot of disagreement. I'm gonna keep it very simple and give you just the basic on a few of them. Ethanol extraction is by far the most common, cheaper and easiest one to do. That's the one that people can do in legal state, you can do in your kitchen. Um, that's the one that is very easy for parents to do. You can watch a very close, uh, very short YouTube video and figure it out. Uh, so the advantage of it is that it's more accessible. It's cheaper. The disadvantage of it is that, uh, first of all, you want to make sure that all the alcohol has been purged. Using very high, very strong alcohol to do this, to extract all the cannabinoids and the terpenes of the cannabis plant. So you want to make sure that you purge over alcohol because the last thing you want to give to your kid is a product that has a lot of alcohol because obviously alcohol is not good for the liver, especially in kids, especially in sick kids. Um, the other thing about alcohol or ethanol extraction is that it pulls out a lot of the chlorophyll. 
Chlorophyll is also a controversial subject because for some people, chlorophyll is very beneficial. Chlorophyll is the reason why the ethanol oil you would get if it's an oil, for example, would be more of a dark greenish color. That's an ethanol extraction. And that's because of the chlorophyll. Some people do not support chlorophyll and give them a lot of stomach issues. So they can have chlorophyll. But some people thrive on chlorophyll and chlorophyll is helping them out. So something to keep in mind, if you're using a product is ethanol extraction and you're starting to see some stomach GI issues, uh, that is maybe not your cannabis. That might be your, uh, your, eth your, your ethanol-based oil. So you could switch to a different type of uh, extraction and usually take care of that problem. One of the most popular type of extraction, which is really gaining a lot of steam in the market, and the picture on the, on the slide right here is actually a super critical CO2 extractor. It's CO2 extraction. CO2 extraction is using pressure to uh, extract uh, the product. So some people like to call it solventless because it doesn't have a solvent like ethanol or butane or propane for say. It's using just steam and pressure to get your uh, cannabinoid, your terpenes out. CO2 extraction, the first generation of extractor used to have a hard time getting a lot of the terpene. You will lose some of the terpene, pro, uh, terpene when you extract it this way. The new machines are so good, so uh, the technology has improved so much that you don't have to worry about this. Um, if you have one of the later CO2 extractors, you do not lose your terpenes. You, keep, you get to keep your terpenes and all your cannabinoids. Um, but that was, I know, a concern of some people in the earlier world of CO2 extraction is that sometimes you will lose some of the terpenes because their boarding point is very different from the cannabinoid point. Uh, but that is not a concern anymore on the brand new uh, extractor. Butane and to a point propane are also very popular uh, extraction method. I'm for one, not somebody that I want to give a butane product to my son just because it scares me off a little bit. You know, it's butane, it's propane. It's not something you should inhale or, you know, have in your body. However, that being said, there are very good products which are made with butane and propane. The key to get those products is to get the correct lab report, and we will discuss the lab report in just a few minutes. But the key on that is to make sure that it's purged and you have no residual solvent, zero ppm or part per million of butane left. The problem is a lot of people doing butane or propane extraction do not have the technology and the lab um, to be able to go to a 100% clean butane product and zero ppm. So a lot of the times, the butane product on the market, you will have some residual solvent, residual butane, and that's obviously uh, not very good. So if you can find a, a clean butane pro uh, product and you have the lab report to show it, butane can be very beneficial. The last one I want to discuss is exane and to a point NAFTA. This is an old way to do things. This is uh, the beginning of the Rick Simpson oil. People are using NAFTA and then exane to, um, you know, to extract the product. A lot of the isolate product you see in the market, when somebody telling you this is 99.9% .9 pure CBD or pure THC, a lot of those products are extracted with hexane. I am not a fan of hexane because hexane is actually very dangerous and can cause cancer in some people. So as a rule of thumb, I will always stay away from an hexane product. Uh, you will see, like I say, more hexane product in the what we call the isolate world, not the full spectrum product, but the pure CBD, pure THC product. A lot of them are using hexane, and I will stay away from those products mostly for the reason uh, of the extraction method. Now, if we're talking about carrier oil, if we're talking about oil, uh, there are different ways. Uh, the carrier oil is pretty much the way, the oil that you're mixing with your uh, CBD or THC or any cannabis uh, concentrate. You're mixing that together. The reason you're mixing it is uh, to make it easier to dose. You're dilu diluting the, the product, uh, the concentrate, because it's very hard to, to dose concentrate. Concentrate is often very thick and gooey product and you can just be like i need 0 0.2 milliliter of that it's very difficult to do so by mixing it with an oil it makes it much easier to dose especially for the kids some of the very popular one probably the most popular one is mct slash coconut oil mct stands for medium chain triglycerol and that is actually a coconut oil with the lauric acid removed so it's a manufactured product but it's liquid uh, and that's why a lot of people like it. it's liquid coconut oil now, um, one of the big benefits of coconut oil is the lauric acid. You won't get that on the MCT, so just keep that in mind. But a lot of people like the MCT because uh, a lot of kids like the taste of it. Uh, it kind of masks the taste of, uh, of the cannabis sometimes, the herfy tones of cannabis. 
Um, safflower is also a very popular one. Safflower is good because it has a very long shelf life and it's uh, antimicrobial. So any product made with safflower can usually last, um, keep a little bit longer. Olive oil is also a very uh, good one because very few people are allergic to olive oil. So olive oil is, is, uh, is a popular choice. Olive oil, however, does not keep as long and after a few months can go rancid. So you really have to keep an eye on your olive oil product if you're using olive oil and you know you're using it fairly quickly. Now, when you're looking at vape pain and uh, vaporizing oil, a lot of them are made with propylene glycol or what we call PG uh, for short. That are the kind that I will stay 100% away from. And the reason for that is that there are studies now showing that when you heat up PG, it can, call, uh, it can uh, burn into other chemicals that can cause cancer. So uh, that can be very dangerous. So if vaping is your favorite admission route for your cannabis, uh, usually we're talking more about adults, uh, while you know, uh, vaping for kids is still very controversial. So we are talking about adult. Uh, try to find a product that is you, you either using vegetable glycerin or pure cannabis oil, but does not have a PG in it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as there's a great majority of vape uh, pain oil on the market today are uh, PG based, and that's something I would stay away from. So let's get to the really big important part of this presentation and lab testing. Uh, without lab testing, you really cannot make the decision on what product is good, what product is not good. Um, it's unfortunately not as simple as it should be. First of all, a lot of companies are, have their own machine to test uh, the product for development, uh, for R&D. The problem with that is sometimes they try to give you those tests as your lab test. Now, I am not saying my company are faking the test and you know, forging it. I'm saying that it's been done, unfortunately. I'm not saying everybody's doing it, but it's been done. And I'm saying that it's often better uh, to make sure you have a third party lab, uh, a, lab a, a test report from a lab that just does that, that is not associated with, affiliated with any of the manufacturer or people selling the oil. Um, those di differ from state to state. In some state, there is no labs. In some states, uh, they can only take product to test from dispensaries and not from parents. So you have to find your own lab uh, your, in your own state. What is the law regarding laboratory testing of cannabis? Uh, and fortunately, it's not uh, not all states are created equal. And in state like California, for example, it's much much easier to get your product tested than in state even like Colorado or um, or Florida, for example. Um, what you can do if you want to make sure is when you find, when you get the lab, and I'll show you in a few minutes some sample uh, lab report, you will have the name of the lab in most of them, and you will have uh, a, a number. It's totally okay and actually recommended the first time at least when you buy a new product to call that lab and say, hi, uh, my name is, you know, Sebastian, and I just bought this all for my son Jagger. And uh, I see that you tested the, uh, the lab, this is a lab report, and you tested the oil for XYZ uh, CBD. I just want to verify, did you test that? And my lab report shows when it's 20 milligrams per milliliter. Can you confirm that? Lab should be able to tell you that. Um, so that's a nice peace of mind if you want to make sure when the lab re uh, report is not forged, for example, or if for some reason you're not really sure what's going on. It's always good to verify the first time. Some of the California lab, put a QC code, uh, what are the code you can take, you know, those little funky square, and you can take a picture of on your phone and it take you somewhere. Uh, those are good too. You can take a picture of that uh, on your lab report and they should take you to the lab and you can verify that way. Another thing which is very important to know is what kind of machines the labs are using. Again, not every lab are created equal. Right now, uh, HPLC, which is Ultra Performance Liquid Chromatography, or UHPLC, Ultra Performance, as a favorite machine, but those are very expensive. Uh, the picture on the presentation is actually an HPLC machine, but those are not cheap, so not everybody can have them. The older way to do it is with a GC or gas chromatography machine. The problem with that, and this is the reason why you need to ask the right question in the lab, ask them, especially when you come down to potency testing, ask them which machine they're using for that. If they tell you they're using a GC or gas chromatography machine, that is a red flag, and the reason for that is then when the sample go, to, go through the GC machine, you actually get heated up. Um, when your cannabis is heated, 
uh, if you get heated to a certain temperature, your THCA can transform and decarboxylate into THC, right? Um, so if you get your potency testing and it's done on a GC machine, very often it could actually show you that it has more THC than it really does and less THCA than it does because of the heating up uh, process going to the machine of the sample. This is why, at least for your potency, you really want a HPLC test or UHPLC test result. The last thing to know about the lab is you can check the credential. Again, I know I'm going to repeat that a lot. Not every state are created equal. And in some states, there are simply no uh, lab testing um, certification. But in some states, they can have ISO certification. They can have state certification. So you want to check with the lab and ask them on the certification and just give them a call and say, are you certified? What are your credentials? Or you can look online on their website. Those are usually posted. Now let's talk a little bit more about the kind of specific kind of labs that you're looking for. There are a lot of lab tests, but really the top six, which are the most important, are potency, microbial, residual solvent, heavy metal, pesticide, and terpenes. We are now going to look at each one of those individually and explain why they are important and how do you read one of those tests. Let's start with potency. You cannot dose, accurately dose cannabis for kids or any patient if you do not have a potency lab report. That is a lab report that is going to tell you how many milligrams of THC per milliliter is in your bottle of oil, for example, or CBD. It's going to show you all the cannabinoids which are in the product. Uh, if you look at the uh, picture, you see a, a pie chart, and the different colors are all the different cannabinoids on this sample. It shows you... Uh, so you absolutely need this to be able to test. You need this to be able to keep track of what's working and not working. Maybe why is making the difference for your kid? It's really not the CBD, but it's the CBG. Uh, this one strain has a little bit more CBG than this one, or it's a CBC that is helping with the brain recovery, and that one strain you know, has more than the other one. So secondary cannabinoids are also very important, and they should be listed in your potency testing lab. Report. So this is why it's important. You must have it to dose, and you must have it to know really what you're giving your kid, and that can help you uh, when you're looking at different strain down the road. That can really help you to uh, narrow down what's working and what's not, not working for you. The second one, which to me is one of the most important, is a microbial test. This is a sample from a steeple in New Mexico. And this is very important because kids like Jagger, for example, with an autoimmune system uh, issue, if I were to give him a, a cannabis product that has bacteria or fungus or E. coli or salmonella, I can make things much, much worse really quickly. Uh, even on a healthy person, you shouldn't be giving salmonella or yeast or mold. So those uh, microbial testing are very important because, let's face it, cannabis is a plant. Sometimes it grows outside. Sometimes it grows in the greenhouse. But it's a plant. If you can have salmonella on broccoli or spinach when you buy at a grocery store, or E. coli, trust me, you can have it on cannabis too. So it's very important to know when your product is safe and clean. Uh, sometimes the product can take a little bit of time to get this result because if they find something in the initial test, test they will actually grow it into a petri, di petri, petri dish sorry, for up to seven days to see if the bacteria is growing there. So it could take a while to get this uh, report back, but it's a very important report to make sure that you're giving a safe, clean product to your kid and at the end of the day, the emphasis of this presentation, the emphasis of starting uh, cannabis therapy for your kid is to help, not to hurt. And in order to help, you want to make sure you're giving a clean product. I think a microbial test result is a very, very important step in that direction. Resident solvent is very important as well. We discuss those depending on the extraction method. If you know your product is made with CO2 extraction, that is not such an important test to get because you will not have any solvent. If it's made with ethanol or alcohol, it's very important. On the slide right there is actually a, a product that has alcohol extraction, ethanol extraction, that was not purged correctly. And you can see the big spike in um, that reddish, pinkish color. Uh, you can see that big spike, and that means that it has ethanol. It's usually uh, measured in PPM, which stands for part per million. Um, if you have, let's be honest, if you have a really low PPM, it's, you know, 5, 10 PPM, it's probably going to be okay on the ethanol. Uh, I like to see zero, to be honest, or non-detected. 
uh, sometimes the machine doesn't go uh, to zero, but it goes to very low, and it, it doesn't say a number, but it's tell you non-detected or ND, but it's fine too. Uh, again, a little tiny bit of ethanol could be okay, uh, but anything like hexane or propane or butane, that should be absolutely zero. If it's not, it's not a safe product, and it's not something I would give to, um, to especially not to a kid uh, or a sick person. Heavy metal, that are becoming a problem uh, mostly with uh, outdoor grown cannabis. So the reason, or hemp, CBD. So the reason for is called something called um, bioremediation. And the hemp plant, and to a point the cannabis plant, because they're both the same family of plant, uh, they like to draw toxin out of the ground. Uh, they are, those plants are used to clean up soil that was... Um, spoil with a split of oil or nuclear uh, product or things like this. They, they use hemp uh, plant or cannabis plant to grow, to clean the soil. But that means then that plant is taking everything off the soil. That means then in some instances, if it's grown outdoor in a soil that you don't know, you could have lead, arsenic, or mercury, uh, you know, or other uh, heavy metal in your product. Now, I like to see zero on all of those, but there is lead in almost everything and a little bit of arsenic in your rice when you're eating. There are very low level of contaminated, contamination. So uh, it's important to know the limit. Uh, if you uh, have a lab result and you show a tiny bit of lead, like this one on the example show 0 0.006, that is totally fine. That is way um, less than the safe amount, which is 0 0.005. Um, so this is you know, a tiny bit, it's a trace amount, probably the same thing you will get in your rice, and that is okay. Uh, but again, it's very important to get that test and to know. Um, this is very important uh, is, uh, with the outdoor grown plant and with the product that come from overseas. And fortunately, as this green rush is booming, people are trying at times to, um, to pass very subpar product um, onto the patient. And sometimes what companies are doing is they're buying paste of uh, CBD, uh, hemp paste from China, which is a byproduct of when they extract it to make rope or clothing, is a byproduct. It's like a waste, but it, it's going to a paste, and they ship it to the U.S. Some companies are buying it, running it to a couple of filters, which is definitely not enough, and uh, mixing with oil and selling you that as a CBD uh, product, which end up to very often be really cheap. So their old gimmick is that oh, that's a cheap product. You can try CBD. Uh, this is why you need a lab report, and especially in that case, a heavy metal lab report, um, because those uh, company and those products are very often contaminated with lead and arsenic. So again, if you're not 100% sure of the origin, if you don't know if it's grown indoor into controlled soil environment, ask for a heavy metal test. Pesticide. Um, pesticide used to not be a problem, but unfortunately, again, as we are now going into this green rush and everybody wants to put product on the market and the growers have a lot of pressure on them to grow as many cannabis plants as fast as possible, uh, some of them are starting to use pesticide. Uh, and that is very bad. But it's very bad because obviously pesticide can have very dangerous long-term side effects, especially on kids that have uh, immune system uh, issues. But on anybody, it's not good to eat pesticide. Um, and, you know, Again, the growers are trying to get the product to the market and they have white fly or they have, you know, something on the plant and they say, I can't lose all my crop. I got to take care of it. Hey, I'm going to spray that and it will be fine. It's not going to be fine. Huh? There are natural way to take care of pesticide, but unfortunately, those cost more money and sometimes take a little bit more time. And some of the uh, unscrupulous growers that are not uh, there to help the patient, but really just to make money. Um, might be using pesticides which are not approved. Uh, that has been seen a lot lately with the recall. There's been a lot of recall, especially in the state like Colorado. A lot of products were recalled and taken off the shelf because they tested positive for some very dangerous pesticide. Now, one thing to keep in mind about cannabis, and uh, it's about USDA organic certification. Because the cannabis plant itself is still a Schedule One substance in the Controlled Substance Act and it's still federally illegal in the U.S., there is no USDA organic certification on cannabis, unfortunately. Because if they were, that would be a nice peace of mind because you cannot use pesticide or anything like that to get your USDA organic certification. However, on the hemp plant that is used to make CBD, there is a USDA organic certification. 
very few companies have them, but you can always look for it. You can Google it. And uh, there's a handful, probably even less than that, company that have a USDA organic certification on their AMP plant. It's not on the final oil product because that's, again, not possible. But it's on the actual crop itself. So that will give you a big peace of mind because you know that to get this certification, you have to go through a very, very long process. And they are subject to surprise tests and inspection and visits. Uh, they cannot use any kind of pesticide. They have to be grown in a certain closed environment. Uh, so if you are looking for CBD product, uh, look for USDA organic certification. Uh, that will give you a nice peace of mind. Unfortunately, that is not available on cannabis product as of today. And finally, the last uh, lab result I want to talk about is terpene. Terpene is a fairly new field. Terpenes are kind of the essential oil um, of, of the plant, of the cannabis plant. Terpene at the plant level have two main functions. One is to attract pollinator, like bees, to make sure the plant reproduces. And the second is to protect the plant from predators by emitting some kind of smell that could be um, you know, repulsive to uh, small animals or insects that want to eat the plant. Um, if you use essential oil in your life, any kind of essential oil, you use terpenes. That's pretty much what it is. Um, terpenes is not, terpene testing is not available everywhere. Uh, it used to be just really a California-centric thing. It's slowly gaining ground and going to different uh, state. It's still much, much easier to get terpene information in California than anywhere else. Uh, in Colorado, for example, it's almost impossible to get it. In some of the states on the East Coast, it's very difficult. So, uh, again, the West Coast, California, Washington State, Oregon, much easier to get terpene profile. The reason terpenes are important is because that could hold the key on why a product is working or not working. Um, you know, somebody might be like, oh, I try this XYZ CBD and it's really, really not working for my kid. But I try ABC CBD and, or XYZ CBD and it's working for my kid. Uh, but they're both CBD. They both have the kind of the same uh, CBD concentration. Well, you got to look at the secondary cannabinoid like we talk about, CBG, CBN, CBD, um, uh, uh, CBC, things like that. But you also have to look at the terpene. Maybe it's because he has a lot of linalol. Maybe because he has uh, a lot of myrcene. This is why it's working. Or maybe it's because he has beta caryophyllin. Uh, this is why it's working. So as we're trying to really pin down what's working, and as we're trying as parent and patient to really see what's helping us, I think a terpene profile on a product is very helpful because it could help us in that quest to find the absolute best product. Uh, it unfortunately, will take some time as far as trial and errors. Um, there's still not a lot of doctor around that can help you with cannabis, so uh, it puts the omen on the parent and the patient. Uh, so keep good notes on what's working and what's not working, which strain is helping, which strain is not helping. And if you are lucky enough or fortunate enough to have a terpene profile, you can maybe, hopefully, after a few different strains, see a correlation of a strain with this terpene in high quantity seems to help you or hurt you, uh, uh, depending on you know, the result you're seeing. So terpene profile is very new. It's very important. I think it's a future of personalized cannabis therapy. Uh, so hopefully we're going to see uh, more and more terpene uh, testing available in more and more states. So cannabis is very safe. Everybody knows that. But there are still things that can happen with cannabis. And I think it will be a dis... Uh, you know, uh, it would be very important for me to uh, tell you what can happen. So what are some of the side effects or safety concern you could get when you start medical cannabis therapy. If you do not have a microbial test result and you don't know where your cannabis is coming from, it's very possible when you could get a bacterial or fungal infection for the cannabis, which again explains why you should really get a microbial test result on your cannabis. You could be sleepy. Uh, that is very common side effect. It usually goes away after a few days, uh, but uh, it's not unusual for people to be sleepy, to feel tired when they start cannabis therapy, even just CBD. Uh, that usually goes away for after a few days. If it doesn't go away, you just back down on your dose a little bit, and usually that takes care of it. Uh, you could have allergy. Uh, that could cause in, uh, diarrhea or any uh, GI issue. That is usually not an allergy that will come from the cannabis itself. I don't know anybody allergic to cannabis, not to say it doesn't exist. I just don't know anybody uh, in all the people I'm talking to or, or patient and parents I talk to. It's more than likely coming from the carrier oil. Maybe MCT oil doesn't agree with your stomach. Maybe safflower will give you a reflux. Uh, so if you're starting to see some GI issues shortly after starting your cannabis therapy,
uh, it's more than likely the carrier oil. And then hopefully um, you have a choice of carrier oil where you're buying your product. You can just switch maybe from coconut to safflower or from olive oil to uh, MCT or so on. Agitation and paranoia, it's very rare, but it's possible. But it's usually a sign when you are not using the right strain. And unfortunately, that I means you have to do more um, trial and errors. But that's usually a sign that the strain that you're using is not ideal for your condition. The most important possible side effect is interaction with medication. A lot of the medication you take are processed to what we call the P450 liver enzyme, and so is cannabis. The reason this is important is because cannabis itself is not going to do anything or change anything to itself, but it can increase or decrease level of medication in your blood. So uh, advice to take is if you are taking any kind of medication that are processed to the P450 liver enzyme, and the way to know that is you can Google your medication and uh, P450 liver enzyme. Um, number two things you need to do. Number one, you need to try to get a baseline blood serum level of those medication. This is just a simple blood test that will tell you the level of medication in your body uh, of those medication and the concentration you're seeing in your blood. After you start cannabis, two weeks or three weeks after you start, get another test, compare it to your baseline, see if it's doing anything. Then probably after a few months, do another one. And if you don't see any interaction, um, any change in the, uh, in the concentration, you are okay. Um, but cannabis can increase level of medication without you knowing. So it can actually get you to a toxic level of medication, or it can decrease it without you knowing. So you're giving your medication every day, but it's almost kind of like going to a win. Uh, this is uh, most often seen with seizures medication, and that could be a problem because all of a sudden now you're starting this cannabis therapy that is supposed to help, and it works for a few days, and then it stops working, and you're like, what's going on? Uh, that could be that he was working in combination with your anti-seizure medication, but now your anti-seizure medication level is too high or too low, and it's causing issues. So uh, space it out. Any P450 med and cannabis should be spaced out by two hours when you give it to the, when you give it to the patient, to the kid. And get a blood serum level before starting, and then after a few weeks and a few months, to see if there's any F, um, interaction. And finally, the last thing uh, I want to talk to you on the product is about the therapeutic index and the safety of cannabis. The therapeutic index is a combination of LD50 over ED50. And let me explain very quick what that is. LD50 stands for lethal dose. So in a lab environment, they will take some mice, for example, and of any medication, they will give our mice a dose of medication. And they will keep increasing the dose until they kill half of the population of the mice. At what dose does half of the population of the mice die? That is your lethal dose. ED50 is your effective dose. Same concept, keep giving medication. At what dose do you see some kind of beneficial effect on the mice? You take the first number divided by the second one and give you an index. The higher the number, the safer the medication. Uh, and cannabis is 40,000 to one, making it one of the safest substances on earth. For example, morphine, valium, uh, fentanyl, all of those have an index of less than 100 to one, very dangerous for the opiates. Cannabis is 40,000 to one, making it much, much safer uh, than those alternative. So now that we talk about product, we talk about the grower, we talk about the product, you know how to read a lab report, Let's talk about the last uh, point in our presentation, which is the law. And that is very important because that differs from places where you are living. There are 30 states plus Washington, D.C. right now that have full medical cannabis program. That, however, does not mean that they are creating equal. Some of those states have dispensaries. Some are working on dis getting dispensaries. Some still have limitations on what you can get. Uh, at your dispensary, but all of those states have some kind of access either today or in the future for the state that just passed a bill. 16 states have limited program, and that is really wide. You can go from uh, actually have access, uh, states such as Virginia that just passed this, or Missouri have limited, very limited program with limited condition, but this and uh, limit on THC or on delivery, maybe no smoking or no uh, live uh, plant or no dry flowers. But uh, those states change from 5% THC limit in Georgia to 0.3% in Utah. So it's a very wide uh, range. Um, the problem is, at the end of the day, is that cannabis is still a Schedule One substance under the Controlled Substance Act. Now, it doesn't make any sense. Everybody, hopefully, watching this today understand that the government 
uh, classification of cannabis as a Schedule One is a joke, and it should not happen. Uh, a Schedule One substance definition is that it has no medical benefit and it has high potential for abuse. We know for a fact that both of those things are not true when it comes down to cannabis. Uh, but the government doesn't want to take it off Schedule One. Uh, cannabis has no room to be on Schedule One, but Schedule One make it then. Unfortunately, it's not legal federally, so every state has to have a law. And depending where you live, you might or might not have access to cannabis because of that. Uh, it's also impeding on a lot of the research we can do. So uh, it's very important to uh, talk to your legislator when you do that and always ask them to take cannabis off of Schedule 1. And actually, cannabis should not even be on any schedule. But anything would be better than one. Anyhow, he has five schedules. But uh, fortunately, one day, and hopefully one day, we will be totally off the Controlled Substance Act. Some states have registry. Uh, actually, most states have registry on a medical cannabis side. Um, you do not need registry when you go to a recreational dispensary. You just walk in, but for medical cannabis, you need registry. Uh, that means that you went to see your doctor, and then you get uh, you get a card that was signed by your doctor, and then you have one of the conditions that qualify in your state. Every state is different. Some state like California, the doctor can decide. Some state like North Carolina, it's only for seizures patient. So. Every state, again, is different. So the reason when it's good to get the card is because even if you say, oh, I don't need a card, I have no dispensary, why do I need a card? It's important because it offers you protection, especially when you talk about children. Uh, maybe it lets you give the oil in the hospital setting, or maybe it protects you if child services come to the hospital when your child is admitted and say, why did your son uh, test positive for THC? Be like, because he's a medical cannabis patient, here's my card. So it's very important to register for the card. In most states, they are fairly affordable, um, and they last for a year or two. And it just gives you that extra little peace of mind, especially if you're running into issue with doctors and hospital, and if your kid, he or she, being admitted to the hospital a lot, it's a very nice peace of mind to have. And finally, we are going to finish with a nice little visual of the map. So remember, we talked about 30 states and D.C. Both are the states in green. Both states have full medical program, no restriction on THC, and at some point we have access. Not every one of them, like Louisiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, they just passed their bill, so they don't have access yet, but they are working on getting access to setting it up. The red state, like Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, all over the place on the percentage of THC, on the access, most of them don't have any access, except for Missouri and Virginia eventually, uh, but there's no access in any of those states, easy access. Um, the percentage of THC and why it's legal vary from state to state. Some is only oil, some is oil and edible, some is topical, uh, some is actually no vaping, no smoking at all. And then you got four states in uh, blue, which are the four states in the country that has nothing, not even uh, what we call a CBD or low THC law. They absolutely have nothing. Everything is illegal to them, except uh, the, you know what could be uh, portrayed as legal, uh, the hemp oil under uh, the farm bill at the federal level. But even then, uh, those states uh, frown upon that and are very, very uh, close-minded when it comes down to cannabis. Uh, so the best advice uh, if you live in any of those states is, especially if you live in a, in a red state or a blue state, find out what's legal in your state before using cannabis therapy, find out how to get on the registry, uh, find out what's qualified, uh, and find a doctor that is willing to sign. Hopefully it's your doctor, so it makes things a lot easier, the conversation a lot easier. But sometimes you might have to go to a different doctor just to get your card signed. Um, but anyhow, I hope you guys learned a lot today. I hope you guys uh, know how to select a clean, safe cannabis product now. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of my contact information. And then it uh, looks like we have a tiny bit of time. So I'd like to take some questions. Uh, if, we have, um, you know, if we have some questions, I'll be more than happy to try to answer uh, any question we have. And again, my name is Sebastian. And you can email me at Sebastian at flyinghope.co, not com, CO for Colorado. Uh, and I'll be very happy to answer any question and help you uh, in your cannabis journey. So thank you. And uh, let's take some questions. Thank you, Sebastian, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, if I find a clean tested product in another state, can I just have it shipped to me if I have a medical cannabis card in my state? 
That's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, the short answer is no, uh, especially if it's a product that has more than 0.3% of THC. If it's a product that has less than 0.3% of THC, then you are okay because it would be considered hemp under the 2014 Farm Bill. So while it's still a gray legal area, most products ship every day without any problem. Uh, if you need a product that has more THC than that, it does not matter if you have a card in your state. Uh, it's illegal to ship any product with more than 0.3% THC anywhere in the US. So unfortunately, the answer to that is no, you would not be able to get that ship regardless of your legal status in your state. Well, thank you for that. If a company cannot provide lab reports, is the product still okay to use for my kid? <laughs> Uh, no, I will, I will, I'm going to tell you now. There are enough products on the market today that offer full lab reports. Um, move on, find another product. Uh, you know, if the reason we don't have a lab report is because it's at the lab and it's going to be tested and it's coming in the next couple of days, then wait. Absolutely. Uh, if it's because they can afford it or if you say, oh, you don't need to be this tested, it's a good product. No, 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 no. That, you can't believe people anymore. Unfortunately, too many people are getting into this uh, industry trying to make money, not caring about the patient. Uh, and so you want a lab report. And if the product that you select or you think you selected does not have a lab report, move on. There are a lot of other products that are tested and you can find. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, can hemp CBD oil be imported from another country and safe to use? That is a very excellent question. Uh, Yes, it can be imported from other country. Uh, in, the law is actually a bit different, but it, it absolutely can. And uh, to me, it would be the same thing. Uh, you know, it will be uh, get the lab report. You come from another country, that's fine, but get the lab report with it. And if it has a lab report and it's a tested product and you show that it's clean product and you can verify it's a lab, uh, then you could use it. Uh, that being said, uh, let's just you know, be ultra American for one second here and say that we have a lot of really high quality product in this country, California, Colorado, a lot of the other states, uh, especially when you're talking about hemp, uh, you know, none of those products from our country would have a USD organic certification and a few products from the US have it. So my first choice personally would be to look for a USD organic certified American grown product. That being said, if your product comes from a different country and it's lab tested, there is nothing wrong with it. You can use it. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Sebastian Koch for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 29th, 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.